Are you concerned about the accuracy of your hemoglobin A1C readings? Maybe you've recently got some test results back, or you've been told that you're pre-diabetic or even diabetic based on a hemoglobin A1C test, but you're thinking it doesn't actually add up. My name is Dr. Taranella, and this channel is dedicated to helping you understand your health and what's going on with your body. In this video, we're going to explore the causes of false A1C readings. In particular, we're focusing in on the impact of red blood cell and hemoglobin on A1C readings. So if you're liking these videos and finding them useful, hit that like and subscribe button to continue getting videos like this. All right, let's jump into the video. All right, so before we jump into the causes of false A1C readings, we need to look at what this test actually is first. So the hemoglobin A1C test is a crucial marker used to diagnose and monitor blood sugar levels for those that are pre-diabetic or actually diabetic, and even those that just have insulin resistance and don't have actual diabetes or pre-diabetes. They just have some mild insulin resistance going on. The A1C test is helpful because it's looking at a much broader range of what your blood sugar is doing over the course of three months. It's capturing some of the peaks when you're in a fed state and also some of the low levels if you're someone that's more hypoglycemic. It's particularly useful for those with diabetes to kind of give us an idea of how much damage might be occurring in their tissues, in particularly sensitive tissues like kidneys and eyes and things like that. But again, it's not just for those with diabetes. Let's face it, a lot of people do have blood sugar problems and don't even know it. But how much should you actually rely on your A1C test? Is it good for everyone just to take it right out of the box and use it as is? Or might there be some flaws with this test? This test is actually quite accurate most of the time for most people. And it measures the percentage of hemoglobin molecules in your blood that are glycated. You can think of this process of glycation as the coating of sugar that's occurring on different molecules in your body. Technically, it's a little more nuanced than that. It's actually a cooking process happening on the proteins on the hemoglobin molecule in particular in this case. But you can think of it as just a coating of sugar. And since the average red blood cells live for about 120 days and the hemoglobin is in the red blood cells, we can then use that to calculate an average glucose in your blood, and this is known as the estimated average glucose. But it's basically an estimation of what's happening, peaks and troughs of your blood glucose over that days. So while hemoglobin A1C is a very useful tool, several factors can lead to misleading or inaccurate or false readings. And understanding these factors is crucial for accurate management of your health and specifically your blood sugar. So let's look at some of the things outside of actually blood glucose that can affect this test. So one of the key things that can lead to a false A1C reading are changes in the hemoglobin molecule. Really any kind of anemia in general is going to affect this because typically that means that there's low red blood cells and low hemoglobin. And anemia is defined as or means a lack of hemoglobin molecule or a lack of red blood cell molecule. So anything that leads to a low hemoglobin or low red blood cell can potentially cause a false reading in your A1C. And because there are several different kinds of anemia, there are several different causes of false A1C readings. And so let's look at some of the things that fall into the anemia category of false A1C readings. So of course, the most common that everyone thinks about when they think about anemia is iron deficiency, but vitamin B12 and folate deficiency anemias are common ones to find as well. But let's look at this broader concept in more detail. So hemoglobin variant disorders are also not super uncommon. These are known as hemoglobinopathies. So things like sickle cell disease and thalassemia can interfere with the hemoglobin A1C test because these conditions alter the structure of that hemoglobin molecule. And most of the time are going to lead to false elevations in your hemoglobin A1C reading. For example, individuals with thalassemia minor are going to end up with hemoglobin A1C percentage numbers that are much bigger than what they actually are. So there's an artificial elevation in those A1C levels. And this is because their red blood cells stay in circulation for longer periods of time than someone that doesn't have thalassemia. There's also anemia of chronic disease where the inflammation prevents 
the body from being able to get enough iron to produce those red blood cells. There's also anemia from chronic kidney disease where the kidneys aren't producing enough erythropoietin, which stimulates the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. Medication-induced anemia can also lead to some of these similar false elevations in your hemoglobin A1c. And we know that when people have these kinds of anemias and we treat those, that the A1c levels will improve independent of what's happening with your dietary consumption of carbohydrates. But why is that what's going on in this case? For instance, if there's a lower hemoglobin, why would this lead to a change in the A1c as a percentage of the glycation of hemoglobin? So, for example, if there's less of it, the percentage would be basically the same. Like if I had 1 million marbles and 10% of those marbles are red, if you cut out half of those and you have 500 marbles, but they still have the same mix, you're still going to have 10% red marbles. And in the cases that we discussed so far where there's decreased hemoglobin red blood cell production, what's happening in these cases is those cells are living longer. It's not just simply that the percentage of hemoglobin molecules are less, it's that those red blood cells, in this case red marbles, are sticking around longer and getting exposed to that sugar, getting more opportunity to be coated with that sugar. So even if we had someone with normal hemoglobin levels and we made those red blood cells stick around longer, in other words, they were not destroyed and kept in circulation longer, the same thing is going to happen in that case. The other thing is that there are some variability in testing of the A1C. There have been efforts to standardize testing, but there's still some discrepancies that can occur, especially with like the point of care testing that you might get at like a pharmacy that you can do at home. These types of tests are going to be more susceptible to flaws than a blood sample from your arm. So let's look at some other examples that can lead to false readings on your A1C test. So increased red blood cell turnover called erythrocytosis can also lead to false readings on your A1C test. And again, the typical lifespan of red blood cells is going to be around 120 days, but... As mentioned earlier, the A1C test uses a 120-day average in their calculation for estimating your average glucose. And so anything that's speeding up the turnover of red blood cells can actually lead to shorter duration of those red blood cell life and then can lead to you underestimating how high your A1C levels are. Increased turnover of your red blood cells are seen in cases of like Hemolytic anemia, severe blood loss can also lead to this low estimation of your A1C levels. And even constant blood loss from like menstruation can do this. As long as there's enough resources, meaning vitamins, in this case iron is really common, but any of those resources, as long as there's enough of those and you're losing blood, the, the bone marrow is going to keep cranking out freshly new red blood cells, which are going to have less of that glycation, less exposure to that sugar and it's going to lead to a falsely low percentage on that A1C. On the other hand, if you do end up with iron deficiency, either from losing blood from menstruation or some other reason, that will slow down the production of red blood cells, and eventually it's going to lead to a elevated A1C in the absence of any real significant changes in your diet. Some other gray areas to consider with the A1C test that may be leading you to a false reading on your A1C is ongoing monthly blood loss when you're losing a lot, when you have heavy menstruation, things like this. This scenario is common in females. And again, initially you may see when you have plenty of iron, you're going to have a lower A1C. And then once your iron levels are low and you're no longer able to crank out red blood cells, that A1C is going to look a lot higher. Another scenario that's probably important to mention here too is with blood donations that are common with testosterone replacement therapy. A lot of times they're donating blood every two months, maybe three months, and the testosterone is causing their bone marrow to want to increase the amount of red blood cells that are being produced. And then they go take those red blood cells and donate those. And that constant turnover of new cells and new hemoglobin may give you an abnormally low A1C. Now again, in this case, once you run out of iron, if you do end up running out of iron with that process, then the amount that your bone marrow is going to be producing will start to slow down. What stage that's at for you, you know, each person's going to be slightly different that way, but 
If you end up with low iron states, the red blood cell production will start to slow down at some point. So in this case where you have this abnormal turnover of red blood cells, either a slowed or an increased process going on there, what are you going to do? Are you going to calibrate or figure out what your actual glucose levels are, what your actual average glucose levels are, and how are you going to figure out if maybe you do have a false elevation or falsely reduced A1C level. Well, I did do some digging to try to assess if there's any literature on this specific thing. And I did find one study that looked at the MCH or mean corpuscular hemoglobin, how that can affect your A1C measurements. And what it found was that those that had a low MCH were also associated with increased risk of an erroneous or falsely elevated A1C level. So let's unpack that a little bit. The MCH is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin, and it's basically telling us how much hemoglobin is in one of those red blood cells. If it's low, that means that you may have some issues making that hemoglobin. So the MCH and MCHC are two tests that are very similar that you can use if you think this is going on with you. The other thing is that the red blood cell lifespan is actually a fairly heterogeneous type of thing, meaning that different people, even normals, can be affected in different ways. So after looking at some of this information, it got me thinking about the average lifespan of red blood cells and started to think, what is the average? Is it really just like everyone's the same? Or is it like everything else in medicine and health that there's a bell curve? And perhaps there's some people that have much longer and some people that have much shorter red blood cell lifespans, even though hematologically speaking, they're otherwise normal or healthy. And I did find a study on this, and basically it found that there are variations in the red blood cell lifespan that were large enough to cause clinically significant important differences in hemoglobin A1C readings. And so again, this is just another thing to emphasize that it's important to understand the full context of your red blood cells and hematology when you're looking at your hemoglobin A1C test. And one study even went as far as incorporating red blood cell lifespans into hemoglobin A1C tests, and they found that it demonstrated a more clinically relevant estimation of the glucose that was in the patient. Fortunately, there are other tests you can also use, like a continuous glucose monitor, or even something like fructosamine, which does not rely on the hemoglobin molecule at all. In the case of fructosamine, when the blood glucose levels are high, the glucose molecule attaches to serum protein similar way that it does to hemoglobin and it causes fructosamine instead. This process is non-enzymatic and just basically reflects the amount of glucose levels over the lifespan of those proteins. And so in this case, looking at two to three weeks versus three months or so with the hemoglobin A1C test. But just like the A1C test, the fructosamine test can also create falsely elevated or falsely lower levels of your estimation of your glucose levels. So all tests can potentially be flawed and it's crucial to evaluate your hemoglobin A1C test after considering what your red blood cell levels are, the possibility that you might have something interfering with the production of your red blood cells. And when you do suspect something like this is going on, it's important to triangulate. Use things like blood sugar, insulin, possibly even a continuous glucose monitor test to get a broader understanding of what's happening with your body. And this approach is going to help ensure a more accurate diagnosis and follow-up not just for your blood sugar, but also for your health in general. If you're undergoing treatment for B12 deficiency or other nutritional deficiencies that may be causing low hemoglobin or low red blood cells, just expect that your hemoglobin A1C level may drop once those levels have improved. This is only the case, though, when you have anemia, or is it? For instance, if you have chronically low hemoglobin levels but don't actually have anemia, they're within the normal range. Could treating the low B12 levels actually improve your A1C levels? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to dive into this in another video on this topic. We're going to look at more than just B12, but a few other nutrients as well. So hopefully this video is helpful in your quest to understanding and achieving optimal health. If you do have any questions on this, drop it in the comments section. That's why I do the videos to help you understand things better. And if you want a more customized, nuanced answer, consider joining the membership program 
will have more time and attention to dedicate to your question. Either way, I'll try and answer your question. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, might I interest you in another video on blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C here.